God, thank you for uh, this day. Thank you for the worship that we experienced. And now we pray, God, that you would help us to think well um, about some uh, theological topics as we think about the kingdom of God, as we think about this uh, season of Advent that we're in and what we remember and what we anticipate in uh, Advent. And so I pray, Lord, that you would be with us here in this room. Let us uh, listen well to you, Holy Spirit, as we seek to learn today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So as I understand it, the, the, uh, the title, the topic for this Advent series is Advent, Christmas, and the End of the World. <laughs> I just think that's pretty fun. I don't know. So Advent, Christmas, and the end of the world. And it really, the idea is that we really are um, in the season of Advent. We're looking backwards and we're remembering the, uh, the advent of Christ, uh, the Savior, the, uh, his first coming. But it's also an anticipation of um, Christ coming again. And uh, because that's a promise of the scriptures that Jesus will come again. And so we're, we're looking at, uh, at literature that talks about uh, future future prophecy and that sort of thing. But Rachel and Connie asked me to kind of in the middle of this, and we had a great introduction with that yesterday, or last week with Mike um, into this whole series. And I suppose this is maybe introduction part two, uh, talking about the, the kingdom, of, uh, kingdom of God. Before we get to that, I want to do some uh, book plugs, some, uh, some things that you might want to read, or and more importantly, things that are informing heavily informing what I have to say today. Uh, one uh, book is uh, by N.T. Wright called Surprised by Hope. Uh, it's a great book. He has a lot to say about um, what we'll be talking about today. Another book um, also by N.T. Wright called Simply Christian, and he has a section here about uh, the kingdom of God. But I think probably uh, one of the, the books that is that has shaped my understanding, and I should say reshaped my understanding of the church and the kingdom of God and God's mission in the world, is a book that was written back in the 80s. It's actually a collection of, of pieces by different authors, by Daryl Guder, and it's specifically chapter 4 out of this book. Oh. So it's specifically chapter 4 out of this book. And um, I'm not, I encourage you to buy the whole book. And by, by, way, by way of enticing you perhaps to buy the whole book, I actually have a few copies of chapter four out of this book, which is my most favorite chapter. And I'll be referring to that several times throughout. So I have some copies of chapter four, and I would be glad to give you a copy of chapter four as well. Like I only made, uh, I think, four or five copies, but I'd be glad to give you, I can give you a hard copy or I can give you a, a PDF version of chapter four as a way of enticing you again, not to circumvent buying the book, but as a way of enticing you to buy uh, the whole book. So pick up one of these if you like. To get us started, I want to, uh, I want you to discuss some questions at your table. If you don't have anybody at your table, you might want to join with, with uh, somebody else. Maybe you can join with another table. But here's the, here's the first question. I'll give you uh, just a few uh, minutes, about a 90 seconds, maybe two minutes, to answer this question. What is the gospel? If you were to summarize the you have a, you're riding on the elevator with somebody. You've got it's an elevator speech. What is the gospel? What's the essence of the gospel? So at your tables, take two minutes. And then I want you each to give me the right answer. <laughs> All right, let's hear let's hear some answers. And can I have uh, Wayman? Will you be my microphone runner? <laughs> I don't know. Whoever raises their hand. So um, how about? Any table, uh, what is the gospel in a nutshell? How about this table right here? We do all of these things. Okay, okay. So, uh, so the gospel is about God sending his son to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. Uh, Jesus died on the cross for our sins, was raised from the dead. Uh, he's now been resurrected. And, uh, and also while Jesus was on earth, he, 
he, uh, he taught us about some things about how to live and, and kind of simplified the message of the Old Testament. That's, that's the uh, essence of the gospel. Okay. All right. Somebody else. What's, what's the, how about this table back here? What's the gospel? Okay. So added to that, we, uh, because of all this, because of what Christ has done, we get a taste of what the kingdom of God is about. Anybody else want to add or adjust anything to that definition of, of the gospel? David? We have a us to each other, so it's sort of that idea of reconciliation. Okay, okay. The, the essence of the gospel is reconciliation, God to us, us to God. And us to each other. And us to one another. So it's, it's a so divine a human reconciliation <laughs> and a human to human re, uh, reconciliation. Very good. Right. Very good. Like that. Okay, here's the next question. What, uh, what is the Christmas, what's the essence of the Christmas story? In relationship to the gospel. So, so it's about God coming uh, in Jesus Christ, uh, being born as a child, experiencing uh, the, the breadth of human existence, the fullness of human existence. Yes, very good. Okay. Anybody, uh, anybody else want to add anything? How about somebody that hasn't said something? Don? Uh, it's the Savior. Okay, it's the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy about the coming of a Savior. Okay. Yes. I mean, the essence is incarnation, the God becoming man, mm -hmm. so that he can reconcile us. So it's, it's that, uh, it's John 3.16. Okay, it's John. The, the incarnation of God becoming man. Okay. Without that, the fully human, uh, there could, the sacrifice was enabled uh, to sacrifice his life for us. So that, I think that's very good. So um, it's, it's uh, God had to come in the form of, the, of a God-man. Uh, and as a God-man, because he was fully human and fully divine, was able to deal fully with our sin problem. Yeah. That only a, a human uh, being could atone for the sins, of, uh, for our sins, and only God could, uh, could, could resurrect uh, that. So it's the, it was the God-man, yes. Incarnation is about uh, the, the work of the cross being fully effective. Uh, otherwise, it would just be an example of a, of a religious martyr or something like that. Okay, very good. So uh, here's the last. How does, how, does the, how does the Christian story end? Anybody? How does the Christian story end? You can just shout this out. And I'll repeat it. What's that? Eternal life. Eternal life. What else? Excuse me? No end. So, okay, all right. So does, does this thing just keeps going on and on. There's no, there's no end. There's, is that really, that's, is that what you mean? Okay. Is, but what's, is that like our life now or? It's better. So it's like a souped up version of what we have now. No, no, okay. Adam in disagreement back here. Resurrection. resurrection. The end of the story is resurrection. No, not the end of the story. <laughs> okay. I'm asking what the end of the story is. What's the end of the story? What's the end of the Christian story? Second coming. The second is Jesus coming again. That's the end of the story. Kendra, what's the end of the story? Reconciliation with God. Reconciliation with God. A new heaven and a new earth. A new heaven and a new earth. Okay. Very good. Okay. What, here's the last question. What is the kingdom of God? Don't answer that question. I'm going to answer that question. <laughs> All right. So, I want to submit to you uh, that the end of the Christian story, that is the second advent, uh, the second coming of Christ, is about a king and a kingdom. It's about a king and a kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Um, somebody, if you have somebody, anybody bring a Bible? Hope this is Sunday school. Hope you got brought a Bible. So somebody read Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. So this is the end of the book. This is the end of the story. Book of Revelation. I put it at the end because for reasons. So, and then while the, I'm just looking at that, somebody else, somebody else uh, read Revelation chapter 21. Somebody find Revelation chapter 21. The, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Revelation 21. 
I'm just going to read this for us. Uh, John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with him, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. So, New Jerusalem, um, coming from the heavens down to earth. Uh, a new heaven and a new earth. Where in the Bible is the word heaven first named? Where do we first hear Genesis where? Genesis 1-1. Yeah. yeah, right from the very beginning. So God created a heaven and an earth. And that's where it is. So he creates a heaven and an earth. Heaven and earth, um, uh, it, God's, God's plan for a heaven and an earth is spoiled by sin in, uh, in Revelation 3. And then the culmination of human history is a remaking of the, of the heavens and the earth. The culmination of human history is the kingdom of God on earth as it is uh, in heaven or in the heavenlies. Um, and and uh, so N.T. Wright um, talks a lot about this misunderstanding that we have about the end of the Christian story. Being that, because I think I grew up with this idea. Hey, you, you put your faith and trust in Jesus as your Savior. And then that means that when you die, you get your soul gets to go to heaven, and and then that's kind of the that's sort of the, the end of the deal, and and now if I was pressed on this beforehand, I, I might have um, had some clarification. But basically, it was sort of an idea that hey, you know, I'm I'm leaving this world behind, and I'm I'm leaving this body behind. Uh, because uh, what's going to last forever is my soul, and I am going to spin off. I'm going to float off into the heavens, and I'm going to spend the rest of eternity kind of floating around with Jesus in the heavens. The problem is that does not reflect the reality or the cosmology of the New Testament. Uh, when Jesus rose from the dead, how did Jesus rise from the dead? He, he rose from the dead as a real human person, but he rose as a resurrected person, right? So Jesus, what was it? Uh, so Jesus, when he's resurrected, Jesus, um, he eats fish with the disciples. That's a real thing, all right? He talks to them. Uh, Thomas uh, puts his hand in Jesus' side. I have this Caravaggio picture in my office, doubting Thomas, and uh, Thomas is like plunging his finger, you know, into this into this wound in, in Jesus' side. And I just love that because Jesus is not resurrected as some sort of floaty, disembodied spirit. He's resurrected as a, as a man, as a real man. And he's resurrected as a real man with, uh, with, with scars and flesh and the real thing. But at the same time, what does Jesus do? He, he passes through doors. He, pat, he, he just sort of shows up sometimes. So there's some kind of the, some rules to this human existence that his resurrected body doesn't kind of kind of play by, but he's not a disembodied spirit. Yeah, David? The struggle also, though, is that he's, he's almost unrecognizable because nobody recognizes him as, uh, as Jesus' parody. Exactly. It takes words and stuff to get the recognition. So they recognize him, but they don't recognize him. So, yeah, there's something that's that's really familiar about him, but then there's something also that is unfamiliar about him, too. So um, I think when we think about the end of the Christian story, we need to think about Jesus because Jesus is the prototype, uh, the scripture says. What happened to Jesus is going to happen to you and to me, and what happened to Jesus is going to happen to all of creation. Um, that's, that's the end of the story. So the end of the story is about a king and a kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. That's why Jesus, when he taught us to pray, said to pray this way. Pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, if Jesus had something else in mind, he would have told us to pray something else. So what is the, what is the kingdom of God? Uh, the kingdom of God is uh, also in the New Testament. Sometimes it's referred to as the kingdom of heaven. So when I talk about the kingdom of God, uh, uh, synonymously, it's, it's, uh, 
in, in, it's also called the kingdom of heaven. Dallas Willard, who's another favorite teacher and author of mine, uh, talks about the kingdom of the heavenlies. Um, the kingdom of God. Oh, first of all, the kingdom of God is, is Jesus' gospel. You know, I'll go, to go back to the question again about what is the essence of the gospel, um, I, I think that, you know, let's just use Jesus. Uh, Jesus' gospel was that the kingdom of God is at hand. That, that the kingdom of God, the rule and the reign of God is immediately available to you because of me, Jesus says. Now that's Jesus. That's Jesus' gospel. Now, his death, resurrection for our sins, absolutely part of that. Absolutely core to that. It can't happen without that. But, but, but that's, that's only part of the story. The bigger story is the kingdom of God at hand. So Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Uh, the kingdom of God is the rule, the reign, the domain of God's control. It is, it, the, 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 the kingdom of God is where God is in control. It's the sphere where God is in control. And Hunsberger, in chapter 4 of um, Missile Church, uh, says that the kingdom, the kingdom of God is characterized by this Old Testament word shalom, Hebrew word for shalom. And shalom is translated in the Old Testament as peace, but it's so much more than the absence of conflict. Peace, peace um, is, is a dynamic, is, uh, shalom is, is, a, is the realm of God that is dynamic and active. Hunsberger says, shalom envisions the full prosperity of a people of God living under the covenant of God's, I love this, demanding care and compassionate rule. He goes on to say, in the prophetic vision, peace, in the prophetic vision, peace such as this comes hand in hand with justice. Without justice, there can be no real peace, and without peace, no real justice. Indeed, only on a, in a social world full of peace, grounded in justice, can there come the full expression of joy and celebration. So the kingdom of God is the, is the rule and the realm of God. It's where God is uh, in charge. It's where God's order is uh, at play, in effect. Now, um, if the end of the Christian story, the second advent, is about God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, what is our role in that? So between now and the second advent, what do you and I do? Do we just sort of bide our time and hope that something will happen? Or is there something that we're uh, supposed to do? Steve, uh, what? Sir. Yes, questions. Yeah. Thanks for interrupting. I'm going to answer. Okay, all right, good. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me an answer. I was going to get We can do that right now. I probably don't need to say anything else because uh, that's, that's really, that's, I mean, that's the, I think that's part of the essence that, that we can live into this kingdom life uh, because uh, that was the gospel. Jesus said um, that it is, uh, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's immediately available to us. We can live, we can step into that realm of the kingdom right now. It doesn't exist as some future reality only that's far off that's only accessible to us when we die we can begin to enjoy life in the kingdom right now so it is it is here and now um, it's not fully and I'm going to talk about that in a minute it's still to come but we can begin to experience it how live into it and we um, we share that with uh, with others we invite others into it so let me press on that uh, that second piece of it um, and Hansberger, in his essay on, uh, in, again, chapter 4, Missional Church, says, um, he observes that there are two words that we tend to hear with regard to the kingdom of God. And one is uh, the language of, of building the kingdom of God. And the other is the language of extending uh, the kingdom of God. Two verbs that are commonly associated with our role in the kingdom of God. But he takes issue to these. He says that... Uh, Oh, actually, I'm going to come back to that. I hit it too soon. So that, that the kingdom of God isn't really something that we build. It's not something that you and I are in charge of. It's, it's not a social project that we construct. Um, 
N.T. Wright, he, he has some interesting things to, in terms of how he puts this. He says, he says that some, and this might be a good place to interject this. N.T. Wright says some people, it's, people tend to read the Gospels in one of two ways. One way people tend to read the Gospels, if you've come from a more, uh, for lack of a better term, and, and he doesn't characterize this, this is my characteriz characterization. I think in more conservative evangelical circles, we tend to, we tend to read the Gospels um, with emphasis on the end of the story. The Gospel ultimately is about Jesus dying on the cross for my sins. So that when I die, I can go to heaven. When I die, I can enjoy the kingdom of God forever. Um, and then there's this really kind of fascinating introductory material that said uh, that's you know that, that there are some kind of some nice lessons in there and some kind of clever things and some good ways to sort of treat one another. But but the real deal is what happens uh, in those last chapters of each of the gospel: Jesus' death and his resurrection. Um, for those of us that um, uh, emphasize um, the action of the gospel and um, more, for lack of a better term, this really doesn't fit, but, but in a way kind of more progressive, hey, it's, it's about the social work of the, of the gospel. What we, N.T. Wright says, we read the gospels as a grand social project with an unfortunate ending. It's really too bad that this guy who really had so much going for him had, you know, kind of stumbled at the end and, and, and couldn't really carry on the, carry on the movement. And uh, because the real stuff is this social project of, you know, feeding the poor and, and clothing and housing and standing up for issues of justice and, and all those kinds of things. And, and, uh, and then we have this unfortunate ending. And, and N.T. Wright says, no, it's the whole thing together that, that uh, Jesus came to teach and preview and demonstrate the kingdom of God at hand that was inaugurated in his death and his resurrection. You don't get one without the other. They come together. And so, so uh, uh, again, I'm mixing authors here. And so Hunsberger says that the, that, the, uh, that the kingdom of God isn't something that we build in the sense of being a social project. We are not trying to simply make the world a little better place. That's not what we're after. You know, we're not just here to kind of, well, you know, hey, this is all we got. You know, uh, uh, sure, you know, the gospel, the, the book of Revelation says uh, kingdom of heaven on earth or, or uh, uh, thy will be done on earth as is in, in heaven uh, means this is all we got. And so we better kind of make the best of what we have. No, it's, it, God's going to make all things new. Um, it's not something that we're in control of building. Neither is it something that we extend uh, it's not about us being salespeople for God to recruit people to our team, all right? Um, so it's not about building or extending, Hunsberger says. He says, we would do well to go to the verbs that are used in the New Testament, which are the verbs of receiving and entering the kingdom. And so Luke chapter 18, uh, verse 17, Jesus says, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a small child will shall not enter it. So it's, it's something that we receive and it's also something that we enter. He also says, uh, so unpacking that a little bit more. So in this business of, um, of receiving, there is, uh, Mike, like you said, there is a present reality to that receiving as well as a future reality. Uh, reality to that. So Jesus says in Luke chapter uh, 12, verse 32, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you uh, the kingdom. It's yours right now. Um, I don't think I have this one up. Yes, I do. Uh, Mark 10. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for such belongs uh, the kingdom of God. So, Hey, it's right now. Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand. You can step into my kingdom life right now. I, I like to just, everybody go like this. If you've been here very long, you know, the kingdom of God is at hand. That means that the kingdom of God exists as a realm, uh, interlocking, overlapping with our reality right now. And we step out of the realm of brokenness and death and destruction, the kingdom of the world, into the kingdom of heaven, not by dying and spinning off to some floating place, but by entering into the life of Jesus. Um, and so that can be a present reality. But it's also uh, something that we inherit in the sense of a future promise. 
a future reality. Uh, Matthew chapter 25, verse 34. Then, then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then James 2, verse 5. Listen, my beloved brothers, has God not chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs, heirs of something you inherit, uh, the kingdom which has been, which has, uh, which he has promised rather to those who uh, love him. So it's a gift to be received, and it's also a realm to enter. Again, it's a realm to enter in terms of a present reality. I have a note here down. Oh, never mind, I'm not going to there. So present reality, Colossians 1, verse 13. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. From one realm into another realm. Those realms exist separated by sin. Separated by the fallness of sin. So as we, as we give our lives to Jesus. And, uh, and put our hope and trust in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, we cross from that realm into another realm. Present reality. It's also future destiny. Not everyone who says to me Lord, Lord will, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. Okay, I already just covered that point. Oh, let me let me let me read this. <coughs> so this is kind of a way that N.T. Wright gives some summary. It's a little, little bit of an extended passage, but um, so so here's the thing. So Hunsberger says we can't really talk about building the kingdom of God. He doesn't like that language, but N.T. Wright likes that language of, of building. Um, a building and the kingdom, doesn't he, Connie? But here's, here's the distinction. What's that? It is slightly different. And here's the big difference. Um, because N.T. Wright also would take issue with, hey, building the kingdom isn't something that we do. It's not our project. It's not like Jesus says, okay, guys, I got you started. Now you finish the work, you know. Um, so it's not something that we do. It's not something that we're in charge of, but it's, but it's something that we participate in this building the kingdom. Yes. I, I like that. I, there is choice, I think, on our on our behalf, a decision to uh, to enter into that. It's into right that there. All we got to do is leave all this worldly crap behind. That's that's true. Yeah, yeah. We, we take on a different relationship with this worldly crap, right? Uh, it's not our it's not our home anymore. But but uh, we're we're engaged in this world. And 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 N.T. Wright talks about not building the kingdom, but building for the kingdom of God. He's, he uses the analogy of a great architect who's, who's building a grand cathedral and a whole host of masons. And uh, none of those masons has the whole picture. They, they don't know the whole story. They just know that they're laying block right here. And they don't really get it. You know, I don't really understand what this is going to fit into. But I know that, that the master architect has called me to lay this block here. And when I'm done here to do this block and to do this. And, um, but the, the culmination is at the end when the master architect, when the, when the kingdom of God is on earth as it is in heaven. And it's this grand cathedral and we all get to stand back and go, whoa, so that's what I was doing? And so I, I, think, that's, I think that's really cool. So, so it's in this line. Uh, he talks about uh, being guided and directed by the spirit to build for the kingdom of God. Um, he said this brings us back to 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Uh, that what we do uh, in the Lord, uh, make sure that it's not in vain. And then he goes on to say, I quote, You are not oiling the wheels of a machine that it's, that's about to roll over a cliff. You are not restoring a great painting that's shortly going to be thrown on the fire. You are not planting roses in a garden that's about to be dug up for a building site. You are, strange though it may seem, Almost as hard to believe as the resurrection itself, accomplishing something that will become in due course part of God's new world. Every act of love, gratitude, and kindness, every work of art or music inspired by the love of God and delight in beauty of his creation, every minute uh, excuse me, every minute spent teaching a severely handicapped child to read or to walk, every act of care and nurture, of comfort and support for one's fellow human beings and for that matter, one's fellow non-human creatures, 
And of course, every prayer, all spirit-led teaching, every deed that spreads the gospel, builds up the church, embraces and embodies holiness rather than corruption, and makes the name of Jesus honored in the world, all of this will find its way through the resurrecting power of God into the new creation that God will one day make. This is the logic of the mission of God. I love that. I just love that. Um, that's the way N.T. Wright kind of talks about our participation. Um, you know, here's, here's what I want to say. Yes, yes. It would be better to have. So just so everybody could hear, Marjorie is saying, the language of building the kingdom for her has been associated with an isolationist kind of, kind of mentality. That um, the way you build for the kingdom is you create a, I'm putting words in your mouth, so, so tell me if it's not right. Um, you, you sort of build this little uh, conclave, enclave rather, uh, you know, that where you sort of isolate and huddle down and, uh, and don't I interact with the world. And she's troubled by that, and that's not the picture of, of life in the kingdom of God. Yeah. Um, yes. 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 Um, th I think that's a great segue. Some, just one last thing I want to end with, because um, because the question may be big. So then, what what do we do? Do we just sort of uh, hang out and kind of try to do our best, uh, not not get too tainted by the world, and yet um, uh, you know uh, also interact with the world around us and that that sort of thing? And and so Hansberger uh, talks about. talks about that our role, and I love this, um, is to rep as, as ones in whom Christ dwells in the light, who lives and who live in the, in the unshakable kingdom of God, that, that, that we, and that's the church, are to represent the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. We're supposed to represent it. And he notes, Hunsberger notes, that the, that the verb represent can be used passively and, uh, and actively. Um, so, so in other words, there's a there's a, a passive meaning to the word represent, which is um, which is one which is one one thing stands for another. So, uh, N. T. Wright wrote a book about surprise by hope, and this book represents the thoughts of N. T. Wright. Um, Another way that we use the think we could think about represent would be the way that a movie trailer represents a movie. You watch the movie trailer, you that's not the movie, but you get an idea of what that movie's about. You read this book, you're not sitting down with N.T. Wright, but you're getting an idea of, of some of the thoughts that are represented by N.T. Wright. And so uh, Hunsberger says that's that's part of what we do as the church is we represent. We give a sign and a foretaste as to what the kingdom of God is going to be like. This isn't the kingdom of God. It's not the kingdom of God in its fullness. But it looks a lot like this when we care for one another, when we love one another, when we walk through life's crap with one another. You know, that's, that's, what, that's what the kingdom of God, it's not the kingdom of God, but it, but it looks an awful lot like this. It's a sign of the foretaste. He also says that the kingdom of God, um, that we represent the kingdom of God in the active sense. And so in the active sense of the word, uh, the church is an agent or an instrument of, kingdom, of the kingdom of God. So when Rex Tillerson, as Secretary of State, goes and talks to, um, you know, conducts negotiations, he is representing and carries with him the authority and the power of the government of the United States because he's, a, because he's Secretary of State. When an ambassador uh, in a foreign country uh, speaks and acts, they have the power to represent uh, uh, the, the kingdom. And, and Hunsberger says, that's, that's what we do too. And because Jesus says, right, Jesus says things like, if you don't forgive people their sins, then, then your, your sins aren't forgiven. In other words, we have the power to, to pronounce forgiveness. Now, we're not actually doing it. We're not actually forgiving people, but we're representing the power of forgiveness uh, in, in, in one another's life. I see some people going, hmm, that's kind of weird. But, but there's, there's real power, right? When, when you have, when, you, I'll just speak for myself, when I've blown it, 
and I've confessed my sin to another brother, and they say, uh, Steve, I remind, I, I'm a re as a representative of the kingdom of God, I pronounce that you are forgiven. That's what we're doing in worship. When we do confession together and, and we remind you that we're forgiven. We're not forgiving you, but we're representing the kingdom of God. Same thing when we speak about justice in the world. Hey, this is the way it ought to be. We speak and we, we proclaim justice. So it's this idea of representing the kingdom of God in a passive sense as foretaste and a sign. And as an agent and as an instrument of, of, uh, of the kingdom. And then he ends with this. And this is what I really like. It says it's... So pick up this article. I'm hoping you want to read this. And I should say this chapter four, I mean, this really informs a lot of my thinking. I've said it again about the church and kind of what we as a session are thinking about as we envision the, the future of, um, you know, where God continues to lead us as a church. But he talks about representing the kingdom of God as its community. So in our being. So there is something that represents the kingdom of God just by how we do life together. And that's why it's so important. We talk about relationships mattering. Uh, that's why we don't gossip, you know? That's why we don't cut one another down. That's why we show up when, other, when we're going through difficult times uh, together. We walk alongside one another. That's why we're honest and transparent with one another because that's what it means to live life in the kingdom of God. That's why we worship together. That's why we celebrate the sacraments together. It's what it means to be the community. So. And, and in being in representing the community, uh, representing the kingdom of God as community, the world sees uh, the sees the kingdom of God. In doing and representing the kingdom of God as its servant, the world tastes the kingdom of God. So when we go out and rebuild houses down in Dickinson and League City, um, people are they're getting a taste of the kingdom of God. When we, when we stand alongside somebody who's going through a, a, a difficult time, they, they taste uh, the kingdom of God. And, and as we proclaim, we represent the kingdom of God as its messenger, and the world is invited to receive the kingdom of God. And I think all three of those things have to be working together. It's not just enough for us to have our own little, you know, holy huddles. And I believe that God wants us to be holy, distinct. But I think we have to exhibit lives that are holy and completely different than the world around us. Because too often the, the world looks at us and says, well, I don't really see any difference. You know, I, I, so why, why would I want that? Uh, but, but it's powerful when people look at you and say, wow, you, you face the same kind of junk in your life that I'm facing in my life. You've been through some, some stuff in your life that I'm going through, but, but you seem to handle it differently. There, there seems to be something different about the way... The, you know, what's going on in your life. And, and that's different. But it's also um, doing the work of the kingdom and inviting people into that as well. So, I had a couple, I have five more minutes if you, somebody wants to. Read something for her who is really desperate. It sounds like you were, you were in touch with um, the activity of the kingdom of God. And that, oh, that, that was very much. Yeah. I'm going to close in prayer on that note because that's a good way to end. God, we are, are no better, and uh, our lives are broken, and in need of a Savior, whose name is Jesus, and um, we thank you that you have found us, and we pray that we would represent uh, the kingdom life that you have graciously invited us into, that we would represent it well as we give a sign and a foretaste of what that kingdom looks like as we... Um, serve the world around us in your name for the sake of the kingdom as we proclaim the good news that uh, the kingdom of God is at hand. Um, God, shape and form us and make us as your people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, go in peace. Thanks, everybody.